Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome back everyone uh, to the 16th lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. Uh, in this lecture, we will make a formal break from Spatial Statistics and start to focus, uh, you know, on Spatial Econometrics. Within Spatial Econometrics, we will begin with what is called as the Spatial Regression Analysis. Uh, spatial Regression Analysis will provide us an opportunity to conduct uh, multivariate uh, you know, uh, uh, statistical analysis. What does it mean? We will see, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, and we will sort of, you know, while we sort of, you know, kick off this, this module, we will do a review of the traditional regression analysis for all of, all, all of you who may not have seen uh, or studied regression analysis earlier. We will go over the basic material and I will uh, sort of, uh, you know, provide you references which you can go back and read uh, if in case you want to learn any of these subtopics in traditional, traditional regression analysis in depth. We are not only covering this review of uh, regression analysis, uh, which is non-spatial in nature uh, uh, for, just a, for just sort of doing a recap of it, but also this recap will provide us uh, an opportunity to learn where exactly does spatial regression analysis depart from regression analysis. Just like in case of statistics, you know, we always started with a traditional statistic and then we found points of departure from there, right? So we will look at crucial assumptions of traditional regression analysis. We will study this pathway from correlation or association to causation. And also we'll look at the impact of heteroscedastic errors on the least squares estimator. So we'll, we will talk about these things. If you have not heard of these terms, there's nothing to worry about, but uh, this is very crucial to also learning where does spatial, uh, you know, dependence uh, show up in regression analysis. Then we will move on from this, uh, you know, non-spatial regression to a spatial regression where we will look at the specification of spatial dependence. What are the alternative ways of specifying spatial dependence in regression uh, models? Then we will study the estimation, uh, you know, of model parameters in the presence of spatial autocorrelation or spatial dependence. And finally, we will think about causal inference in a spatial regression, right? So we will, uh, we will review these things. Towards the sort of the last sub module within spatial econometrics will be about uh, this idea of spatial lags in order to account for spatial dependence. It is a convenient specification for you know uh, uh, specifying spatial dependence regression models and it allows us very powerful interpretations of how spatial spillovers can uh, you know uh, uh, can impact the, the the processes the random processes that we see around us in the real world okay um, within that we will talk about something called a spatial weights matrix we will look at some of these uh, spatial dependence summary statistics you know specifically the moran's eye the Geary C, which are based on the definition of this spatial weights matrix. Um, then we will study regression analysis in, in presence of spatial lags. And finally, we will introduce hypothesis testing. We'll ramp you up. And then of course, there is a large literature to be, uh, you know, explored uh, uh, at, at your own time. Okay. So let's, let's get started with a review of regression analysis. All right. So um, when I do that, you know, what I want to do is I want to sort of start with a, uh, you know, uh, a mathematical formulation of a regression model and also a graphical uh, representation of a uh, regression model. So among the regression, uh, you know, regress within regression analysis, you, we have something called as the simple regression, simple linear regression model. Okay. The simple linear regression model is goes as follows. It's y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 
xi plus ui, where i grows from 1 to n. So we have a data set of yi's. These yi's could be, you know, groundwater levels, something that we have looked at uh, uh, quite extensively throughout this course. But also we could now sort of think of something, a newer example, let's say the price of homes, right? I mean, when we started this, uh, you know, uh, lecture series, we studied or looked at these, uh, you know, spatial real estate phenomenon for the National Capital Territory of Delhi. And at the time I had said that we want to be able to explain what goes into this phenomenon as it comes up in space or as it shows up in space. Right, so, so from that standpoint, going forward in this module, we will take the example of, you know, home prices. So let's say we take an example, let's specify the example of home prices or house prices. So that means that yi is defined as some price value of a home, uh, ith home in a given communities or in a city or a state or whatever. Um, okay, and we have n such homes to study and these homes as we view them, the prices of these homes as statisticians and econometricians, we are going to view them as random processes, right? So we are going to say that yi or let's say we can say pi is represented by a prob probability density function f of pi, right? It could be a normal distribution, it could be a you know, it could be anything. Uh, if it's a parametric distribution, you know, you will have a, uh, you know, a, 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 a parameter, the density parameter, uh, uh, you know, f of theta, right? But the idea is that pi can take multiple values, right? Each home, each ith unit of analysis can take multiple values in, as far as their price is concerned. And it's going to be drawn from this PDF f of pi. Right? So there is some variation in, 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 the, in the PIs and the regression model, what it wants to do it, it wants to explain this variation using a variable Xi, right? So, so Yi, Yi by itself is called as a predicted dependent, uh, you know, or the response, a response variable. We want to explain the variation, the variation that is, you know, the PDF, that is the true PDF. We want to explain its properties using a covariate Xi, right? Now, when I said covariate, all I meant was Xi by itself is called as a independent variable. It's also called as an explanatory variable, right? It's a variable that explains variation in PI or YI, right? It is also called as a predictor variable. It is called as a control and it's also called as a covariate, covariate of YI, right? Okay, all right. Uh, so this portion, this particular portion of, of, of the regression is, that is beta 0 plus beta 1 xi, if you, if you, if you realize it is a systemic source of variation in yi, right? It's a systemic source of variation in yi. Why is it called systemic? Because it is a, uh, you know, it is a, uh, a, a tangible source of variation. So if Xi varies a little bit more, Pi will vary a little bit more, but I can measure that change, right? I can, I can observe and measure Xi. I have data for Xi just like I have data for Yi, right? So what would be a good example of, you know, Xi? Xi would be, you know, a property of the home. Let's say how spacious it is. We can in include an index of the spaciousness of a home or a house by looking at the number of rooms in that house, right? So, so we can say Xi is number of rooms in house I, right? So, uh, so that means we can say this is Ri, right? So we are writing a model where we are trying to explain variation in Pi 
using a, a separate variable ri, right? So there is a systemic portion, systemic component of variation that is, uh, you know, going to be the one which is our model, uh, modeled variation, right? And what remains, what remains which we could not explain through xi is called as the model error, which is called as the disturbance or error term, okay? This is a random source of variation, right? Uh, now, random source of variation is critical to regression analysis, right? Why is that? Well, it's because the, the way I sort of articulated, we say, okay, as an econometrician, if I, someone tells me, can you explain the variation in PI in a given community? Why are some homes lesser, less of less price? Why are some homes of high price? Uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Why do we see the type of da spatial data patterns or data simple non-spatial data patterns in terms of why are all homes, you know, in the world not priced equally? Well, you know, it can, it can then be explained by a systemic portion, but as an econometrician, I must view the prices of homes as random variables, right? As random variables. Now, where is this randomness going to arise from in my regression model? It's going to be, a, it's going to be embedded in this term UI. Right? Whatever is xi, that is number of rooms in a home, that's a dis, dis, you know, that's, that variable is non-stochastic or non-random in nature. When I say that a home has four rooms or three rooms, I don't mean that it's three plus minus two, right? It, I don't mean it's four plus minus, you know, point uh, two, right? I mean four exact four rooms when I say ri equals four. So that's, you know, a degenerate, uh, you know, form of explaining the variation in pi, right? And the, and the source of randomness is this disturbance or the error term, which my model could not explain. So, right, we cannot be perfect in explaining every real world phenomenon, right? So, in that spirit, you know, the regression model has two components. One is called a systemic portion, which is the modeled portion. The modeled portion has an independent variable and it has what are called as the model parameters. Right. In this case, we have the intercept that is beta, beta 0 and we have the slope that is beta 1. Why are they called what they call? Let's look at that uh, below. Okay. So now let's conceptualize these data. So we have a data set. We have a data set which comprises of columns PI and RI. So I have data. Right. So I have prices for, let's say I have I's are the IDs of homes and I have, let's say data for 1000 homes where I have for each home a price level PI and a corresponding, you know, uh, 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 you know, number of rooms or the space on, over which this is built, let's say indexed by RI. Okay. Then with these data, I can definitely con conceptualize a scatter plot of PI versus RI. Let's say that scatter plot for these 1000 data points looks like the following. Of course, this is not a perfect plot, but I'm trying to try and plot it. Okay, so let's say the room number of rooms could be one, could be two, could be three, could be four, could be five, could be six. Let's say maximum there are about eight room homes, or huge homes that we are looking at. Now, what a regression is doing, the systemic portion of the regression is saying that this PI can be explained by a real line, a real number line which has an intercept beta 0 and a slope of beta 1, right? This is a regression line, right? But for every given xi, let's say when xi equals 3, if I go and look at the graph, you know, the model will give me beta 0 plus beta 1 times 3 as the systemic component of PI. This is the model version, the regression model version of PI. 
The true PI, however, is not the same. The true PI for this one lies either here or it lied, you know, here. In that case, this distance between the truth and the modeled version is my error representation. Okay. Remember also that here beta 0 and beta 1 are a data driven, you know, understanding of what the intercept and the slope should be. So, if I have data driven representations, I use this terminology hat. Okay. If I estimate or predict these parameters, you know, uh, to be predicted or estimated, you know, once I estimate them using the data, these the intercept and the slope are called as beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat because they are no longer the true model this they are no longer the parameters of a true model, but they are the data driven, you know, uh, estimates of what beta 0 and beta 1 would be if I were to believe that y i is indeed going to follow the true model that I have specified as an analyst. Okay. So, this is this gives you a gist of what a regression model is. It's at the end of the day, it's a, a it, it is a regression linear regression equation, right. When I say linear, it means linear in parameters, right. If I were to include x i squared here, it will still be a linear regression model because it is linearity between y's and beta's, the model parameters and the dependent variable. So, the linearity is between not between y and x in a linear regression model, okay. It is very important as a review, uh, you know, from review point of view, okay. All right. So, this gives you a gist of what a regression model is, how does it view the world, how or what are we trying to really explain here. We are trying to explain variation in prices that we view in real world data sets. The fact that all these prices are different for different homes, they can be, you know, they, they can be ideally unique for each home. Uh, but then what explains this? Well, one thing that could explain is how big is the home that we are trying to price in a market, right? So, so that is that's the way to sort of, sort of conceptualize it. There is a regression equation. The regression equation has a systemic portion, a non-stochastic portion and a stochastic or a random portion or a component, right? So, ui is random in nature. At every xi, ui can be a different value, right? And, and, and the fact that yi was viewed by an econometrician as a random variable is contained in this error term which is ui. So, a part of it is deterministic, fine, but a part of it which remains which I could not explain with xi is obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, explained by ui which is the error term, but the error term is random in nature, right. So, that is the basic premise of a regression model. Now, obviously, the, the, the linear regression model is a bit restrictive, you know, A, it's, it only has one regressor. Now, a price of home is not only explained by the number of rooms, it is also explained by things like amenities around, right, pub number of parks in the community, right. Um, what is the quality of schools, uh, you know, in that community? What is the state of public infrastructure, roads and, you know, uh, uh, you know, crime, uh, you know, control or kind of security, safety and so on and so forth in that community. What is the access to local, uh, you know, a local market uh, for, uh, for convenience of, of, of residents of that community? There are many factors that drive, you know, what, how a home is priced eventually in a market, right? Now, a linear, simple linear regression model is one which only has one covariate. In this case, it is xi or ri if y i is p i, right. Now, uh, uh, you know, uh, to be able to, to relax this restriction, we have what is called as the multiple regression, regression model, okay. Now, uh, you know, multiple regression model allows me to include more than one covariate that is it allows me to include you know a general number of many covariates as many as one analyst thinks that will explain the you know variation in y i okay again u i has the same representation 
right? So now you have, you know, your systemic component is more complicated. right but the error term is still you know exactly the same although its real world formulation will be different because now when we included only one xi let's say x1i what we did was we put all the other xi's x2 to xk into ui when we included x2 to xk now ui has whatever is not included from x1i till xki right so whatever we exclude from the regression in a simple linear regression, it's all in UI, right? Now, obviously, you know, it's a multiple linear regression model because the linearity is between Y and all the betas. So now if X2I was, for example, X1I squared and XKI was, let's say, X1I, uh, you know, to the power K, then, you know, you will still have a linear model. Right? It doesn't matter how nonlinear is the formulation of X, but what matters is, you know, the fact that the model parameters are still linear in Y. Okay, so that's a note. Um, all right. The other thing that I want to sort of talk about going forward is that a regression, a regression model uh, is, you know, uh, 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 links the mean value of yi, that is the dependent variable, with the mean value of xi that is the covariates. What does that mean? Well, that really just says that, let's say I begin with my simple linear regression model, SLRM, I have yi equals beta zero plus beta one xi plus ui. Now, if I were to take an expectation on, 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 on this, uh, you know, on both sides of this equation, I'm going to have expectation of yi, equals expectation of beta 0 plus beta 1 xi plus ui. Now the expectation operator is a con is a linear operator, so it will start entering and applying to each term. Here beta 0 and beta 1 are constants, they do not vary at all, even across i is they don't vary. So I have beta 0 plus beta 1 expectation of xi plus expectation of ui. Now, expectation of UI is assumed to be zero without loss of generality. I will just come to what this, what it means by this assumption of without loss of generality. But the idea is that now what you see here is that the equation once we assume expectation ui to be zero, this equation is really linking expectation of, uh, you know, yi with the expectation of xi, which given the n values is nothing but the sample average of y, y is and the sample average of x. So what happens is that at the end of the day, a regression model is a model on the mean, right? It is linking the mean value of xi with the mean value of yi. Okay, now it can happen for, you know, if I go back to my, uh, you know, my, my graph, what's happening is that this regression line is nothing but expectation of PI, expectation of PI equals beta zero plus beta one. Now these are hats, these are data driven slopes and uh, slope and intercept, right? Beta one hat expectation of RI, right? That means that the average of you know, R i, let's say R bar, wherever it touches this line will also refer to the Y bar value. And all this is doing is that every, at every point in X i, on X i, 
I'm actually going and figuring out what is the average y value. Okay, so it's a model on the mean. If I keep xi as, you know, variable, then it will be y bar to be figured out at every xi. Otherwise, y bar and x bar will pass through a regression line, right? Now, so this is the representation of a regression. A regression line is a model of the mean values of an estimator, okay? Of, of, the, of, the, of the dependent variable and the independent variable. Now, while we explained this, we, we introduced an assumption right away for which we had for, on which the definition of the regression line is based. The fact that a regression line is a model on the mean depends on expectation you are to be equal to zero. And I have said that we are calling this a without loss of generality assumption. So what is a without loss of generality assumption? In order to move forward, I'm going to start talking about, you know, the crucial assumptions of a linear regression model. Okay, so the first assumption that we are going to talk about is the expectation ui equals zero, which I am calling as a without loss of generality assumption when beta zero is included in the linear regression model. That is to say that when the intercept is included, then expectation ui equals zero is a without loss of generality assumption. What does it mean? So let's sort of see what it means. So we have yi equals beta zero plus beta one xi plus ui. Now, expectation of yi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 expectation of xi plus expectation of ui. Now, say, say that expectation of ui is equal to a bar. Note or notice that as long as beta 0 is included, we cannot differentiate between itself and a bar, right? We cannot differentiate between beta 0 and a bar, right? So if we assume, so if we assume a bar equals 0, then you know, any and all of the impact, if this assumption were not true, let's say we assumed a bar equals zero, but it was non-zero, all of that impact will be captured by beta zero, right? If indeed this was a non-negative number, you know, you could simply think, think of beta zero as beta zero plus a, and then you can write expectation of ui equals zero, right? So then, you know, any, and all of its impact will be captured by beta zero, even if it were, you know, even if a bar were non zero, a bar was non zero, hence, expectation of ui equals zero is known as a without loss of generality assumption. Okay. Now, you know, we can represent this assumption in vector format. So, we, we can see that now. So, a1 in vector form is written as expectation of u equals zero. So u is now a vector which is n by one size because we have u i is going from u1 to u n. So this is a column vector just like an Excel sheet column going from u1, u2 all the way till u n. Similarly, the zeros are also n by one. Now I can rewrite this as expectation 
of u1, u2, u3 all the way till un equals 0, 0, 0. Now, expectation being a linear operator, just like just enters the vector like if it were a multiple lambda, right? It's just like if it were a constant lambda, it would simply enter and what will happen, it will apply to each element of this vector. So this means I'm talking, what I'm saying here is expectation of u1, expectation of u2, keep going till expectation of un, all of these will be zeros, right? So all I'm saying is that expectation ui equals zero for all i going from one to m, okay? Now that's it. So, so this from here to here, what I'm using is that expectation is a linear operator. We've used this property earlier in this course as well, but I hope this will make things very, very clear. So this is a first crucial assumption of a linear regression model. Thankfully, when the intercept is included, this assumption is a without loss of generality assumption. So let's move on to the second and perhaps the most crucial assumption of the regression model, right? I'm going to call it the most crucial assumption Right, and we will see why, we will see why in a minute. I'm going to write down this assumption as expectation ui given xi is zero. What this means is that not only overall the error should, you know, sum to be zero, but for every given xi the errors must sum to zero, right? If I go back to my scatter plot between pi and ri, right? If I go back to my scatter plot, let's say I have again 1000 homes, I have my data, you know, and I'm simply going to now draw a regression line. I know this regression line is on expectation of pi given ri, which is nothing but beta 0 hat, beta 1 hat ri, right? Now, Obviously, for every value, for every value of Ri, for every value of Ri, the model is suggesting that there is a level of, you know, uh, uh, Pi, which this is nothing but expectation of Pi given Ri, you know, let's say Ri equals R tilde. Now, this will be R tilde, right? But for every Ri, you have to understand that there is a predicted value and there is truth. So now the truth can be different. So for example, the truth is here and the predicted value is given by the green dot. The distance between the two is the error of the model. It's that error model, model error, right? So every point, every data point and its distance from the regression line actually represents an error. Now this error is sometimes positive, it's sometimes negative. The assumption that expectation ui is zero is basically saying that when I sum these errors throughout my sample, my scatter plot, they will sum to zero. That's A1, that is assumption one. Assumption two is a bit more restrictive. Assumption two is saying that for every value of ri that I can find my data for, there is we can, we will have expectation ui equals zero. That is to say there is going to be error where the predicted value is an underestimate of the truth, but if there is also an equivalent value of the truth, which where the predicted value is an overestimate of the truth, in a way that this underestimation, overestimation, they actually cancel each other, okay? That is what this second assumption is trying to, uh, you know, trying to tell you. Now, you know, what does it mean? Well, before I go on to what this, what it means mathematically, let me just say that this is a crucial assumption for causal inference. So the impact, you know, just because I have written yi equals beta zero plus beta one ri plus ui, just because an, as an analyst, I have decided to put y pi 
on the left hand side and ri on the right hand side doesn't mean that you know uh, the directional relationship is from ri to pi right equivalently i could have just flipped the model and put ri on the left hand side and pi on the right hand side does that then mean that you know the price impacts number of rooms did the market price come before the number of rooms well no it didn't right now how do you decide the directionality you know how do you decide the impact that you are seeing is indeed from ri to pi right to be able to say that the assumption in front of your screen is needed right if expectation ui given ri is not equal to 0 beta 1 is not providing a causal impact of ri on pi it is merely a correlation or association between pi and ri Okay, so if I were to just look at a correlation metric and not even specify a regression, I would have been fine, right? The pain that I'm taking to come to the regression analysis or regression modeling is to be able to work with this assumption, which is expectation UI given RI equals zero. Okay, now let's see how this assumption, you know, mobilizes causation. Now, so, so let's, let's write down our model of interest pi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 ri uh, plus ui. Now beta 1, beta 1 is nothing but del pi by del ri. As an interpretation, beta 1, as an English interpretation, beta 1 provides a measure of increase in pi increase in pi upon a marginal change remember marginal change means the delta change in ri in ri right that is ri goes by a unit one well you're, we are talking about number of rooms so you know you can't have half a room or a one fourth of a room or one eighth or three eighths of a room if you have another room, you have another room, right? Okay. And this relationship will hold at all levels of RI, right? It doesn't differentiate if I'm going from a single bedroom apartment to a double bedroom or a three, three bedroom or a four bedroom or so on and so forth. This specification, PI equals beta zero plus beta one RI provides me a beta one change in PI upon a one unit change in ri now see that now see that the above interpretation crucially relies relies on the assumption that expectation ui given ri is equal to 0 right uh, to be able to see that let's say you have pi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 ri plus ui and pi tilde when ri goes from ri to ri plus 1 and i have a new error variable ui tilde right then pi tilde minus pi is attributable this change is attributable only to ri delta ri equals 1 if ui tilde minus ui is equal to 0. That is to say that the, you know, the, the, the error term, the change in error when we move on from a smaller house to a bigger house nothing changes in ui nothing changes in this unobserved uncaptured error term of the regression model if indeed you know if you had a situation where ui minus u tilde is not equal to zero then we cannot say that this change you know uh, 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 this change in uh, you know pi tilde minus pi is not attributable solely to delta ri rather it will 
be confusing where is it coming from? Is it coming from a change in rooms or is it coming from that unobserved factor sitting in UI? Now the question is what would be that unobserved factor? Let's continue that in the next part of this lecture. Thank you. Thank you.